Hey everyone, I'm Robbie Cornthwaite. I'm Daniel Mullen. I'm Angelo Costanza. I'm Marco Fleury. I'm Marcelo Garuska. I'm Ian Fife. This is Casio, and you're watching. 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 And you are watching Pure Bread Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. And welcome to the Pure Bread Reds, Adelaide United Fan TV. I'm your host, Ellis Gelios, and I'm joined today by a foundation player of Adelaide United. It's his second time on the show. He was on the show just under 12 months ago. It's Michael Brooks. Brooksy, how are you going? G'day, Ellis. How are you, mate? Uh, thanks for having me. No, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, Michael Brooks, obviously uh, a very, very significant person to have on the show after the unveiling of Carl Veer as the uh, interim manager for Adelaide United for the remainder of this very strange season. Brooksy, you played literally alongside Carl uh, across various stages of your career. You were both at the club uh, as foundation players during the 2003-04 NSL season, and you obviously played with him back in the Adelaide City days as well. What are your sort of uh, fondest memories of, of playing alongside Carl over, over a great career that you both had? Yeah, well, our association actually starts um, a little bit further back from that, Ellis. We uh, we both grew up in Wyala um, as young as young kids, um, and both moved to to the big smoke, if you like, of um, of Adelaide, and and both made our um, our debuts for uh, for Salisbury United in the old um, what was the State League One, and then Carl moved to uh, to Adelaide City, and not long after I moved to Adelaide City as well. So, look, Carl um, Carl's always been one of those unassuming uh, types of fellas. Um, very quiet. I remember um, back in the day at Adelaide City when we were training at Salesian College down near the old Burbridge Road, Sir Donald Bradman Drive, and and uh, Zoran used to have to make him when he came into the change room to say hello because he just basically wanted to come in and train and 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 do his thing and then go. And and that wasn't because he was rude. He was a, probably just a shy country boy, but um, he's always been very um, very shy, very cool, very um, unassuming, um, and I would expect that he will take this into uh, into his coaching ranks as well, now that he's the senior coach at Adelaide United. Michael Brooks of Football South Australia, Hall of Famer, of course. Uh, now, you had, you had some great memories uh, playing alongside him, I'm sure. Uh, you then both have uh, touched on, on being managers as well. Um, you are not a manager anymore, but you, you were for quite a number of years uh, you're now in a different line of work but uh, nevertheless um, how would you think Carl is kind of preparing himself to uh, to get into this job now because it's a huge job uh, the team finished off on a, a very disappointing vein of form uh, it was three months ago but uh, nevertheless um, things did not end up well before the pandemic hit for Adelaide United we've since obviously lost the manager Carl has been appointed, being elevated from the assistant role. Um, if you're Carl, having known him so long um, and, and also having, having coached uh, yourself, what's he, what, what's he kind of thinking at the moment? I think, um, I think first and foremost, what was quite apparent bef before the pandemic hit was that it looked to me like a lot of players weren't enjoying their football. And um, I think what Carl will have the ability to do is to to maybe just release that valve and get the players back enjoying their football and, and wanting to be at the training ground and, and wanting to be around each other and, you know, and not sort of just looking to, you know, to train and then leave straight away. So I think Carl will have the ability to, um, to, to talk in a calm and calculated manner, um, still get across what he needs to get across. And that doesn't mean that trainings will be easy, but it, I, I would expect that there'll be, you know, a few more laughs around the training paddock uh, during trainings. And um, I, I think that's what Carl will, will bring. And um, he's got a tremendous amount of knowledge. Um, he's been, you know, around the traps for quite a while. He's now been the assistant coach at United for, for nearly 12 months, I, I suppose. And um, so I would expect that the transition will be quite easily, quite easy for Carl, I would say. Uh, looking from the outside in, books, yeah, I get the impression that he is fairly thick-skinned. Um, with the fact that he hasn't got much experience as a senior head coach sort of make him second-guess himself at all? Is he that kind of character or is he just going to do what he knows and stick to what he knows? No, I don't think Carl's the type that will second-guess. Um, 
he's got a lot of good people around him. I mean, Eugene's obviously stayed. Um, but outside of um, probably the immediate club, you know, he's, he's got some good friends in, in Richie Allegic, Damien Murray. Um, so I'm sure that, you know, Carl's not the type that he believes he knows everything. He's, he, if he feels like he needs to ask a question, I don't think he'd be too shy to ask the question. Uh, of people that he trusts because he knows that he'll get an honest answer back. So um, I think he'll do it his way. Um, and to be honest, I think he needs to do it his way because if you start as a manager trying to be someone or something else that you're not, players will see through that. And um, and I think that he'll just attack it in his, in his nice, calm manner that he normally does. But don't worry, Cole's got a... He's got a He's got a nasty streak to him as well if he needs to. You know, all professional, ex-professional players have. Um, that's probably what makes them the type of um, sports people that they are. So if he needs to um, ruffle a few feathers, I think he will. Um, I think the, his first approach will be calmly, calmly, just to try and get the players, one, back enjoying the game and two, get them on side to his, to his ideas because, you know, the players can make or break him um, this next period of time for the club and for Carl is going to be an extremely important time. Um, if he can get them up and firing and, and getting some good results and maybe make the, you know, the top six, well, and then have a good run in the finals, it's going to be hard to, uh, to knock over, knock him over as an interim coach with the possibility of becoming the full time coach. Yeah. So I was just about to ask um, what he needs to do to get that role. Um, is it that straightforward or does the club need to see that um, the the team's actually reversed its playing style from having been very confused and uh, uncertain under the previous manager? That's certainly how it came to look in the end to uh, having some kind of rhythm to it. I mean, is it is it all results? Is it a simple KPI of just making the finals? I mean, how... How intensely will uh, the power brokers look into this? Because we did see um, Bruce Jute say that they're going to take their time um, and they're not going to rush into any decisions. So, really, in your in your eyes, given that um, you know he's coming in from a pretty low base where we finished off, uh, what's Carl got to do to get that job? I think there's probably a number of things, you know, from Carl's point of view and probably from the club's point of view. There's, there's, there's the financial aspect of of, um, of the club's point of view. You know, can they afford to go out and get either another top Australian manager um, with maybe some more proven experience? Do they look to go overseas? Um, do they bring someone in from their sister club? Um, you know, all of those types of things. So from it's not necessarily um, Carl can do all he can do on field but that may not be enough to satisfy what the club is looking for off field so th those two things have got to marriage each other I think from I think from a coaching perspective I think Carl's got to get one the the, the playing group unified two playing in a, an attractive brand of football that the, the supporters and and the, the supporters of the club and the people that go to High Marshall Coopers they want to be inspired to go back and watch them again the following week. There's too many times over recent times that as a supporter, you go there thinking, you know, who, who, who am I going to watch explode? And we've got some great players, you know, with your McGrees and your, and your James Treacy's and, and so on. And, you know, you want, you want them to be able to feel like they've been unshackled to be able to play the game that they can play, not be restricted. And I think if Carl can galvanise that group, Get them playing some good attacking, attractive football. And above all, you know, it's in any sport, it's the W's and the and it's the L's column. And it's the wins and losses. And if he can play some good football with them picking up some good results and them being unified together, that won't do his harm any any damage moving forward in terms of um, you know, getting the full time role. I suppose the other thing is is does Carl want the full time role? He has stepped in there as the interim manager, and that's and that's great. I mean, he's got the club at heart, so that's you know that's that's a plus from his perspective. But does Carl actually want the job full time? Um, yeah, he he did state that he does definitely want it. Uh, well, then if Carl says that he wants it, then he believes himself that he's ready for it. Um, so this opportunity that he's got as the interim coach is um, is going to do him no harm whatsoever if 
all of those things that I mentioned come into place. The good thing is, is also is that because he's been around the club, unlike some assistants who maybe backstabbed the senior coach to get the position, he's actually just fallen into the position by chance. And that's not, that wasn't any of his doing and it wasn't perhaps any of the club's doing or, or, or the previous coaches doing. It's just sort of how it's, how it's rolled with this pandemic. Um, so he finds himself in the situation and um, yeah, we can only wish him all the best and, and good luck. How much do you think it plays into his advantage to be a club legend? Because obviously, I mean, not only a club legend, but a legend of the game in South Australia, as are you. Um, does it does it give him a bit of a pass with supporters? I mean, if, if it's not Carl Viet and it's just someone else coming in um, and say they just don't make finals and it's not all that convincing, then immediately, you know, no one's going to give them a chance. But you get the feeling that even if Carl sort of narrowly misses finals there might be a lot of people still sort of peddling him as uh, the best choice. Um, I mean, do you think that comes into it much at all? Ha- having been um, such a great player over an amazing career and um, a South Australian icon as well, um, it would be hard for people to, to get offside with him, wouldn't it? Um, I think I think Australian sports in general, and probably football, our football, soccer, I think you find that um, that would probably help initially, but sports supporters are so fickle. And at the end of the day, if the if the team and the club aren't playing or moving in the direction that supporters want, it won't matter whether Carl was our first ever goal scorer in the you know for Adelaide United back in in o three o four. Won't matter that he was the first goal scorer in the in the new A League revamped A League series. It won't matter that he's a club legend. It won't matter that he was the assistant coach. It won't matter one iota. Um, sports and, and football supporters are so fickle that if we're not winning or we're not playing a decent brand of football, Carl's previous history, they won't even blink at that. So while that may have been a feel-good factor to start with in terms of his initial um, appointment, uh, moving forward... It's, it's going to be from this day forward what Carl does um, in terms of galvanising the team and, and playing attractive football and winning football. And I think if he can get those three things together, then it's going to go a long way for people to stop that thinking of he's only been appointed because he's a club legend to, you know, what Carl can actually coach. So I think those things are going to be important for him moving forward. So I don't think the club legend status have much bearing on how we move forward, um, either appointing him as a full-time coach or just seeing it out as the interim coach until they get what they feel is is, is a better candidate. No, I definitely agree, Booksy. Um, coming into it from Carl's perspective, he's obviously seen what happened before the pandemic hit. A lot of questions uh, being put on some of the senior players and, and their lack of effort. Um, he's now coming in with basically everyone fit again. He's got um, the two Ray brothers back. Cassini Yangi was playing himself into a, a nice little patch of form as well, just as the virus hit. Um, how does he now approach this? Does he does he give everyone a second chance and starting afresh, or does he look to his younger players to to really get some inspiration from? Um, well, ultimately, ultimately, Carl's going to be judged by, you know, how the team plays and the wins. So can he afford to go with, you know, predominantly a whole team of youth, youth team players to give them exposure and experience? No, I don't, I don't believe so. And while they're still in the mix of making the finals, um, you know, I, I don't subscribe to giving players a go because they're young enough. If you're 17 or you're 37, but you can still do the job, then you do the job. And if you're the 37-year-old that's the incumbent, you're in the position, it's up to that 17-year-old to knock you out of that position. Not just be given a free go, not be given a go because you're young or because maybe that's what supporters want to see. Supporters ultimately want to see um, the end result being a win for Adelaide United. So if you're 17 or 37, I don't think that will come into Carl's, Carl's calculation. What I think he will do is, having been there as the assistant coach already, while the slate may be wiped clean, 
Cole will still have an understanding of some of those players that he feels he can trust. Now, if you're one of those players when he was the assistant coach that was maybe taking liberties and not putting in and, and, and going in at half-hearted pace and, and not doing his best for the club, for the team, Cole would have that in the back of his mind. Now, it's up to that player to now reverse that decision of in Carl's mind. And so, for me, if I was one of those players, I'd be helping and I'm trying to get back to training as soon as I could in as best condition as I could to make sure that I plant a seed in his mind that he can trust me. If, if I wasn't one of those players, it would be very hard to get back into Carl's, um, into Carl's good thoughts because he's only got a short period of time. So he can't experiment too much because by the time he does, the season's going to be finished. So he's going to, so he's going to have to go into um, this period with the firm belief of who can I trust as players and who do I know are going to do a good job for me. And I think that's, and I think that's the way he'll t- tackle it. Um, we got the announcement that Mark Maria is not going to return. Uh, the left back that was signed for this current season uh, by the ex-manager, Gerdy Amber Bake. Uh, now, a lot of people smashed this player, Brooksy. Um, clearly, he had some difficulty settling in uh, to the left-back position. Uh, it did not go well at all. And I think um, what resonated most with people is sort of why is this guy having been brought in from overseas when a local could probably do a better job, uh, or at least, you know, as well. Um, is this a line in the sand for the power brokers such as Bruce Jutain, whoever else is around him um, and looking to bring in imports. Is this a line in the sand for them to, to really hold back and say, right, you know, we, we really have to get this right from now on because clearly, uh, you know, we're in a market where we can't compete with uh, the bigger clubs. Um, and so if we don't get our imports right, we're really not doing ourselves any, any good at all when it comes to having much of a chance to prosper. So, is, is the Michael Maria failure, if you like, kind of a line in the sand, in your opinion, for how we recruit going forward? Oh, look, I mean, the, the, the issue about bringing in imports to local players has been going around. And I can remember back in the LH City days when we had Michael Musitano come in from Canberra Cosmos and we had myself, Bradley Hassel, um, you know, and a couple of others that were able to play, that were able to play a similar role. Um, for probably a fraction of the price. So this Michael Maria thing is no different. I don't think you can actually label every single import with the failure from before. Every single import has got to be judged on their ability, their their quality. Naturally, you want to see um, their recent playing history, uh, whether that's in, in person, like um, scouting them in person or from someone that you can trust. To, to go and scout for you, um, not just on a video because it's easy to put like a five-minute video of your of your best clips together of you know thirty-second clips and make yourself look like you should have been playing at the World Cup. So um, I think the due diligence is what's required in terms of the recruitment of players, but I don't think that you can necessarily say well all future imports from here on in are going to be bad because Michael Maria was the last one that was bad. I don't believe that that's probably the right way to go about it. But I've always said that, in my opinion, and, and, and probably this should be a philosophy of Adelaide United, is that if, if an import player is coming in, is he, if, is he significantly better than the current local player that we've got? And I'll take a, a Michael Maria versus a... Um, um, I just lost the name there. Um, the one who the coach... Kiddo. Um, Kiddo, sorry, Ryan Kiddo. Sorry, um, so Maria versus Kiddo. Now, if Maria is not significantly better than Kiddo, why are we bringing in Maria on X amount of dollars as opposed to a, a local player who, okay, is not much worse or not much better, either or, but has that uh, connection with the club being, one, a local, two, in terms of the people that will come to support because of that that affiliation with a local South Australian player, like it was back in the first year. So, so the import player, in my opinion, has to be significantly better. And if they're not, then don't bring them in. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree anymore, Brooksy. I think uh, it's as simple as that, really. Um, now, there's a lot going on for the game in a domestic sense. We were very, very nervous uh, with the Fox Sports situation. Uh, obviously, uh, they used a loophole uh, whereby if there was no game staged at a national level for 20 days, uh, they could uh, abandon the deal that was in place until 2023. Um there was since a lot of reports coming out that they wouldn't come back to the table, but they have for at least uh, the remainder of this season and the next um, in a renegotiated deal. Um, what are your thoughts on it? I mean, it's the clubs all losing out on a fair amount of money, as I understand, but at least it keeps the lights on. Um, a lot of people having their say. It's not, um, you know, a, a whole lot of a sort of, future security it's just as we know you know for the next two years um and also there are strong rumors that we will move to winter um which hasn't been the case for a very long time and you would have only known playing in summer yourself um so what are your thoughts on everything i mean it's the game's in a very precarious position at the moment in australia um how do you see it all unfolding and uh, what did you make of the news about the new the new tv broadcaster deal well, I think in regards to the to the TV deals, um, first and foremost, the sport has got to take care of itself. And while I mean, Zora Matic used to have a you know a saying that that the house can be a, a shambles inside, but to everyone else looking looking from the outside in, it looks pristine. And from the outside looking in, it looks in a mess. And I'm sure from the inside looking out, it's a mess. So. If, if we want to try and get this sport to where we all want it, would like it to be, then the sport has to look after itself first and foremost. And for the last 10, 15, 20 years, I don't think the sport has actually looked after itself. And I don't think it continues to look after itself. Um, you know, I, my debut year was when it went from the winter league to, to summer soccer. The reason it went from winter to summer was because... We couldn't compete with the AFL and the rugby leagues of the world in terms of marketing, in terms of sponsorship, in terms of crowd, in terms of um, the exposure, both print, media, internet, like we are now. You, you just don't get that in the Winter League. Now, it's okay to say, well, that means we'll be aligning our, um, our national competition with our grassroots football, but... Maybe we should be realigning the grassroots football with the national competition. I just don't see how going from a summer competition back to winter is all of a sudden going to mean that United are going to go from an average of ten to twelve thousand people to fifteen and a half to sixteen, like it was in the first year when we played. I just don't see how changing from summer soccer to winter soccer is going to improve all of those aspects that we need to improve in order for the game to get better. I just, I think we're, I think we're trying to look for a, an easy, quick fix. And instead of doing our due diligence and doing it properly, we're looking for someone to try and bail us out and help us out when we're not getting our own house in order. And that starts from the grassroots right to the, to the seniors. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the, the push to get the, the juniors playing this year was for, in my opinion, was probably for one reason only, because the seniors or the club has spent the juniors' money on seniors, and therefore, if there was no juniors, they wouldn't be able to give the money back to parents. Now that may be out of line, but that's that's the reality of where we are. So if we're looking for juniors to prop up our seniors, and consequently, the seniors are being paid the amount of money that they are, but the game is not improving. How do we then make the national competition better? If <coughs> how do we make the national competition better if we're not producing the goods from underneath in order to push to make our senior teams, our, our national league teams better or our A league teams better? So, 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 so our sport has to take care of itself before we we, we put out the, the hands and ask for others to help us out. Yeah, so well, so well put together there, Brooksy. I actually can't agree anymore. I'm, I'm really mystified as to why they think winter is the way to go because, um, 
you know, it doesn't make sense. I mean, we, we might get three or four days in the A-League season where it's stinking hot here at Cooper Stadium and it's unbearable. And unless you've got um, shade in the Western grandstand, then it's really not desirable to go out and watch and you might as well sit in your air-conditioned lounge room and watch it on Fox. But um, if, you, if you look to what our winters are generally like, I mean, if you're looking at a 1 slash 3 p.m. on a Saturday, you, you're getting a lot of rainy days in winter. So firstly, I don't see how um, that is going to make it any more attractive to, to come out and actually spectate the A-League. Um, but other than that, I mean, there's, there's a lot of reasons why I think it's a bad thing to do. Obviously, um, we ride off the Premier League momentum a lot and the European leagues. And I think reversing that to, to have us out of season with the rest of Europe is just not going to do anything for the interest levels. I think maybe the only thing they're looking at really, Brooksy, is... Um, is trying to capitalise on the fact that obviously we've got the highest participation rate out of any other code. And so they want to sort of try and capitalise on that momentum in the one sitting. Um, that's to, to me, that's the only reason I can think of as to why they'd really want to go down this route. Um, so, but but yeah. how, how do they capitalise on that, money, how, well, how do they capitalise on that? See, to me, what, what I believe is the, the underlying factor. And again, it's, 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 it's not necessarily in the betterment of the game, but it's in the betterment of the individuals who run individual clubs. And that is some of those that believe that they should be playing in the in the A-League, being the second tier, now think that if they move the A-League from the summer to the winter, they've got a better chance of being able to force a second division where they are then able to play in, a, in order to try and make it to the A-League division. And the reality is that you go back to those winter, league, winter days... And I remember going to Highmarsh, and, and I won't say the clubs, but there were some clubs that used to count two legs as one, uh, uh, sorry, a pair of legs as two attendances because it was two legs instead of the one person. Right. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. there's 1,500 there, but they're counting it as 3,000. And there was no way in the world there was 3,000. So yeah. again, to me, it's, it's driven by... by probably those that want to be involved in the second division because they believe that they should still be in the, the old National League. The reality is that the quality, the quality is not there in order to have a, a quality second division and a quality A-League. There's barely enough talent in this country. Kogo, there's barely, sorry. There's barely <laughs> enough talent in this, in this country to have a quality A-League. Um, no, it makes, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, um, Brooksy, I've got a bit of an interesting one for you. Um, the club is doing a You Design It challenge regarding its logo. Um, now, you played for the club oh, yeah. when, when it had its only other logo ever in history, which uh, it then changed uh, going into the A-League era. Um, do you have any issues with the logo? Should it change? Uh, yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yes? I do. I, I do have a big issue with the logo. Uh, I think it's I think it's nice for uh, for a you know for an opinion and for you know something that's helped to pass the pandemic time of day. Um, but I'm not a big fan of changing logos every other year, every five years, every ten years. Um, I was natural because obviously I was part of the first one. It, it was a little sad to see the first one go to the second one. I do understand that in order to try and um, be of a marketing appeal to the different uh, age groups, um, I, I did understand the change in the logo from the first one to the second one. I didn't mind the 10-year anniversary of which you know, we were lucky enough to get one of the tops that's over your uh, your left-hand shoulder. Yes. Um, so I didn't mind that. But in terms of like, in terms of like our club logo, a club logo should be our club logo. That's only my opinion. Um, you know, I'm not that older fuddy duddy that I, I'm still stuck. You know, 40 years ago, but I believe that that's that our logo is the tradition of our club. Um, and I don't think that it's. And having said that, there have been some really good ones that I've seen on the social media, and I thought, geez, that doesn't look too bad. But mm. I want that as my permanent badge. No, I don't. I still want our Adelaide United logo as our badge. Thank you, Brooksy. I can't believe how much we see eye to eye these days. Um, I will just bring you up on one thing. I think the reason why they uh, disbanded the 
NSL logo and went with the A-League logo was actually, and uh, your former colleague, Nat Harrison, told me this, that um, apparently the ball uh, was, uh, there was a copyright claim put in by UEFA because the ball looked too similar to the Champions League ball. And that's the reason why they changed it. Yes. Yeah, no, I, I have heard that before, Ellis. And uh, so you do naturally understand because you wouldn't want to be, you wouldn't want to be sued by those guys. But uh, that's fine from there to there. But now I just think the logo that we've got should be our logo moving forward. But I, I, like I said, I, I have enjoyed having a look at some of those other ones. And there has been some, some good ones that has incorporated, you know, our, our, our state flag and, you know, the city of Adelaide and churches and, uh, the magpie or the maggot, um, uh, the piping magpie. So uh, there have been some good ones, but for me, leave it as it is. No, I totally agree. Um, going forward, Brooksy, we're hearing that uh, there may well be a opportunity to let crowds into games played to finish this season. It depends where those games will be, but there's murmurs that uh, there'll be crowds at Adelaide United games if they're played at Cooper Stadium. Um, do you have any issue with that at all? Oh, look, as as long as the health authorities have given it the OK that we're able to, um, I think naturally everyone's biggest concern is that if there's, you know, the same with the protesting where, you know, we had some positive cases, not so much from, from Adelaide, but from in Victoria, and they seem to be doing things a whole lot differently to us, um, which is baffling in itself. But... You know, you, we've just got to be careful of this potential second wave and potentially exposing people to, um, you know, to, to to the ability to be able to, you know, contract something again. And, um, you know, I'd hate to see some of the older supporters of our of our club go to go to Hindmarsh and then in, you know, in two or three days time report that they've got some symptoms or, you know, they, they're feeling off and all of a sudden, you know, potentially we have we have a death because I don't think anyone would want crowds if that leads to a potential death. So we've just got to be careful. We've got to make sure that we do things right. A little bit of pain early doors means that we can try and get back to normal as fast as we can. And that's, I'm sure, what everyone's hoping for. So, yeah, we've just got to be careful, that's all. Michael, um you shared a change room with Carl Beer for many years. Can he do it? What What are your thoughts going forward? Look, I'm I'm extremely hopeful. Um, you know, there's always a little bit of trepidation because you you know of the unknown. Carl's um, been in the youth development for for quite a for quite a number of years, and youth development or youth coaching is different to senior coaching. He has been the senior assistant coach for for the past this season. So, um, you know, my hope is, yes, that he can. Um, I, I wish him absolutely all the best. He's, he's a cracking fellow, a scruffer. Um, you know, those that have, have known him for quite a, quite a while, he, has a, he has, does have a, have a quirky sense of humour. Um, he is very quiet and unassuming. He can fire up, but he's, and he's got passion. And um, I don't think anyone would doubt that he's got a lot of passion for Adelaide United. So all we can do is, is wish him the best, um, be with him, support him. Um, try and get behind him as best we can and um, see if we can cheer the boys on to, to a few wins leading up to the finals. Really well said, Brooksy. Just uh, we'll finish on a personal note with you. Um, obviously, I, I touched on the fact that uh, you are no longer in football, uh, but I'm sure you, you, well, evidently, you still do follow it as passionately as you played it. Um, what are you up to these days and uh, how much do you, do you still sort of cast an eye over everything that's happening with your former employers at Lady United? Um, uh, look, I'll, I'll always love the game. I'm, I'm definitely not in love with the game. That's that's um, very clear for me. I'll, yeah, so uh, I'll always love the game. Always keep a, um, you know, a, a passionate eye and interest on on how the club's going. Um, you know, they gave me a chance when I was 33 to, to, to play National League again. So... Um, and it was the people's team. And I, I think that's the one thing that I've always loved about um, our club is that it incorporates everyone. And um, I hope we can get back to feeling like everyone feels like they belong at Adelaide United, not just a select few. But I think the, the club's still got a little way to go from that perspective. But um, 
yeah, so I'm just uh, I'm playing golf now. I'm playing golf quite a few times a week when I'm uh, when I can, and um, just bought myself some new TaylorMade clubs. So TaylorMade Australia, there you go. Um, <laughs> nice shout out. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, yeah, just enjoy getting out on the golf course with with a few mates now, and um, trying to release a bit of the uh, the aggression and anger on a little white golf ball. <laughs> is that is that just a thing to do when a footballer retires, Booksy? I mean, <laughs> it seems it seems to be the the, com- the common hobby that every footballer has after playing uh, around the world playing golf. Yeah, I- I think I think the reason for that is is because it's a little less strenuous on on the joints that have been running around for twenty or twenty five, thirty years or whatever it's been. So um, you know, we don't do a hell of a lot of walking. We generally get carts now, so but the weight's still not coming off. But um, no, you're uh, good, but yeah, I think I think most people do. Uh, most ex players do enjoy the golf because of the less strenuous on the body, um, and um, it's that. Um, Still, it still drives that competitive spirit to try and get the ball in the bloody hole as quickly as you can. And um, <laughs> you only need one good hole or one good shot for it to bring you back the next time. So, um, yes, yeah, it's, it's probably like scoring a goal at Hindmarsh. It just uh, it, it gets in your in your blood, and you just want more of it. Brilliant stuff, Brooksy. Look, you take care of yourself. It's been awesome getting you back on the show for the second time. Uh, there will definitely be a third and a fourth and a fifth, hopefully. Um, within the coming months, but uh, we've really enjoyed speaking to you. As passionate and knowledgeable as anyone is in the game here in South Australia, mate, you take care of yourself um, and uh, we'll, we'll touch base again soon. Yeah, we'll do, Ellis. Thanks for having me and um, all the best for the show and good luck to the Reds. I hope my little dog Coco hasn't uh, provided too much background noise for you there. No, no, no. It, it's the common thing with Zoom calls at the moment. Even the uh, the ex-Premier League players, you see it happening with them at the moment for Sky Sports. So, Brooksy, uh, you're very much uh, just in the exact same light as every other ex-player, mate. So, no issues at all. Great having cool. you on and, uh, and we'll speak again soon. Up the Reds and uh, take care of yourself, Brooksy. Will do, mate, and uh, good luck to all the Red supporters. Make sure you get out and support the boys. Good luck, good luck to Carl, uh, Brucey, and uh, and the club. And let's uh, let's make a good push towards the finals to the uh, back end of the year, eh? All the best, well Alice. Said. Cheers. Good on you, Booksy. Cheers. Thanks, mate.